When we were thinking about our, our 30th anniversary, we really wanted to put together a range of beers that would, one, showcase what we do here at the brewery, as well as pay tribute to uh, some of the early pioneers who really made a difference in the craft brewing world. We all started in the 70s, and Jack McAuliffe went from you know, home brewer to commercial brewer, and that was part of what inspired me to, uh, to open my first brewery. Jack didn't, uh, didn't last that many years running his brewery, but uh, I, I think he was really instrumental in showing that uh, you know, on a fairly small budget, a home brewer could uh, become a commercial brewer and uh, you can make good beer and you can hopefully make a living. I was in the Navy from 1964 to 1968. We got our first liberty. Of course, we go to the, the nearest pub. You get a pint of heavy and it was really different beer. And I realized that when I came back to the United States, I wouldn't have these choices anymore. So the only way to do that would be to learn to brew my own beer. Of course I could start a brewery. The thought that I wouldn't be able to make beer on a larger scale and sell it never entered my mind. We brewed English style ales, porters and stouts, rather than lager. The first time I met Jack, I walked into the New Albion Brewing Company and I said, Jack, my name's Don, I'm going to the University of California Davis studying beer and I'd like to have an opportunity to work for you here so I can get some experience. And uh, Jack said, um, get out, leave, just, just don't bother me, just go. About two months later, I went back again and walked into the office and there was a gal at the desk. I said, Susie, I'm Don. I was here once before and I'd like to work at the New Albion Brewing Company. It's a cool little place and I want to make beer too. I don't want to go work for a big company. I want to start my own brewery. And she said, well, we might have a place for you. And I said, well, I can work summers and I can work for free. She said, you're hired. And I believe when he graduated, we, we hired him. This was a brand new place, a brand new venture, a brand new opportunity in an industry that had been so huge and dominated by large corporate uh, businesses. In Europe and that sort of thing, you know, American beer was treated with a bit of derision and uh, humor. There was this incredible excitement, certainly on my part, and Jack's, Susie also, and the other people who were working there, that we were doing something completely different and something unique. What distinguishes the, uh, the early brewers is they all know how to weld. They can run machine shop tools, lathes, mills. They can do electrical work. They can build houses. If you go past a, you know, a place where they sell steel or something, we automatically hit the brakes and see if they got any good stuff. Necessity is the mother of invention. I mean, how were we going to get that wort into the cellar except by the use of gravity? We, had, we didn't have a pump to do it. And of course, no personnel were allowed below in case there was some sort of an accident. And this 45 gallons of scalding hot wort were to drop. So hoist it up, click, 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 click. And then we hooked it up to a pipe uh, to drain the hot water receiver to go to the bottle o cooler in the fermenting cellar. One of the things that was unique about the way Jack approached the whole industry was very scientific and very mechanical and very focused in the process. When people saw what was happening at the new Albion Brewing Company and they had the same sort of skill set that I had, they said, hey, if that goofball McAuliffe can do that, so can I. We'd heard about this home brewer who had gone pro and, and made the trip over there to see what it was all about. I remember having to pay for beer. You know, Jack was so small, he said, I can't give you beer. I said, I only make you know, so many bottles a day and I gotta sell them all to survive and you gotta buy my beer, which uh, at this point I can appreciate uh, the, the situation he was in. I remember Jack told me uh, a saying that, that uh, sticks with me today is, is the brewery's a strict mistress. That is correct. Do you remember saying that? Yes, of course. <laughs> Very strict mistress. <laughs> 30 years ago, before the craft brewing industry was established, people did not know what hops was. So they thought it was some kind of a grain. They just didn't get it. I had just arrived from Mars and I was speaking Martian. The third beer we're doing with Jack McAuliffe, it's a, a tribute to uh, a beer he brewed uh, back in his uh, uh, early days as a beer he took to parties. We were kind of wild. <laughs> well, I remember going to the Christmas party every yeah. year, and the band, the anchor band, would yeah. play late into the night. Fritz would usually go home by then, so that's when things got a little wild. Yeah. <laughs> the original beer that uh, was nicknamed the Old Toe Sucker was actually a, uh, designed as a porter but uh, it was a fairly light porter and it turned out that it was fairly high in alcohol. 
It's high enough in alcohol to get to a point where even somebody's toes looks very attractive. So. <laughs> he says you were sucking toes or it was him. Here, here. Yes. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, it's a communist life, I've never heard of it. Part of the recollection of the original beer was that it was a barley wine. Another recollection is that it was a porter. So having those two stories come across, uh, I thought, well, why not just make a, a black barley wine? One of the things we were trying to, to accomplish with this beer was actually find some of the ingredients that were available then. Back when Jack and I started, there wasn't much out there, and uh, Cluster was the, the most common American-grown hop. They used strictly Cascades. I'm trying to stay pretty uh, specific to raw materials on this beer that were available at the time, which there weren't a lot of. So just some pale malt and a single roast and some caramel malt, and then using hops that were grown at the time back in the late 70s and early 80s. This version has got about 10% alcohol, not a, a super high bitterness level. The next one we're going to try has got uh, basically the same risk with the more, hop, more hops. Hopping. So there's no wine ingredients other than the style is reminiscent right. and the, the aromas that develop are reminiscent of, of some ports and cherries and mm. aged kinds exactly. of, of wines. I always said that uh, farmers make wine and engineers and physicists make beer. It's fun to be, be back at a brewery and say, yeah, sure.